Good day, I'm Martin Gagel with Market Radius Research. It's Thursday, August the 18th, and we've got CEO Dave Harper of Geodrill joining us. Geodrill is a drilling services company for the mining industry, the leading market position in Ghana, Burkina Faso, the Ivory Coast, and Mali, and it's expanding its presence into Egypt and Peru. I'm glad to have Dave back with us after Geo Drill just released a great Q2 with record revenues and EBITDA. Dave's going to give us an overview on the quarter, and then we'll run through some of the key metrics along with plans and expectations, along with some discussion about the company's recent U.S. listing. But please remember, this is neither recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company. Dave, thanks for joining us. And yeah, please give us an overview on your Q2. Great to be back. Thanks, Martin. Uh, yeah, so we just announced our Q2 results. Uh, the headline numbers, record revenue, uh, 39 million USD. That's up 28% year over year. Uh, also record Reb- uh, EBITDA, uh, 11 million USD. That's uh, 29% of revenue and up 50% year over year. Uh, net income was a, was a near record, uh, 5.9 million USD or 13 cents US, and that was also up 50% year over year. And we continue to grow the balance sheet significantly reaching a milestone uh, in total equity of 100 million US dollars, and that's up $18 million uh, year over year, or 21%. So yeah, the common thematic at uh, Geodal lately seems to be uh, that the records keep falling and uh, should should continue uh, to for some time, I should imagine. Yeah, and just to highlight your total equity of 100 million, which is a, a good chunk of equity. When's the last time you actually did a capital raise? This is all self gen or a vast majority of it self generated equity, right? Yeah, no, it's a very clean uh, structure. We went public in 2010, raising 47 million dollars. Uh, it took a significant secondary off the table at that point in time, leaving me with 40 percent of the company. Um, and uh, we have never done a capital raise. So the same company that listed in 2010, 11 years ago, 12 years ago, is the same company and the same structure that we have have today. So essentially that that uh, that increase in total equity has all been uh, has all been the you know the result of of uh, cash generated from operations. Uh, Growing back into reinvesting the business to add rigs, to add revenue, to add EBITDA, to uh, keep uh, improving the the total equity position. All right. Well, on the quarter, you've got the the strong revenue growth. Can you break down the revenue growth? Where you're in your West Africa is your sort of core region where you've been operating, and then Latin America or South America and Egypt are your relatively new markets. Can you just sort of I. Talk about where the revenue growth is coming from. Well, um, West Africa continues to be uh, our key key market. This is, of course, where we established in 1998, uh, which will be 25 years next year, um, starting with one rig and one contract. That market continues to be very strong for us. Uh, you know, you know, we drill for gold, and the gold price remains very very strong. Uh, but these days we're also uh, also drilling for EV metals, and uh, and and that that now represents about fifteen percent of our business. Now, as a result of growing up and growing out, we've uh, expanded in recent times uh, into uh, new horizons in North Africa, uh, Egypt, which is proving to be a very interesting market for us. We we really like Egypt, uh, and also South America. Um, you know, we like uh, we like uh, South America. Uh, Peru is going. Going well for us. That's an EV play, and uh, some some interesting news uh, to that will be coming your way shortly will be the expansion into another South American country. That's uh, that's days, if not weeks, away from being signed. So so watch this space. Yeah, and on with the revenues, it's both existing clients buying more services and more clients. You've got more and bigger clients. Is that kind of how it's being driven? Yeah, we just keep growing the the, the country profile, uh, the commodity profile, and the customer base. All right, and so you're saying it's primarily gold, but you do have what 10, 15 percent now in the EV uh, metals, that including copper and uh, uh, other uh, sort of non-precious uh, metals. Correct. Uh, battery metals speak for about 10 to 15 percent of our business, and I think that's about to get a bit, it's about to get a bit of a lift. 
Okay, so you're getting more of a diversified um, mm-hmm. uh, base there. And, and so um, on the general outlook, uh, the gold companies have a solid gold base to operate on and exploration companies maybe not as robust to raise funds for new uh, drilling, but it, it is still there. Uh, can you give us how uh, the, the general outlook is? And I guess the outlook really is what's the outlook for the drillers themselves? And then presumably you'll capture a growing share of their uh, business. Yeah, so it's it's an interesting uh, market that we're in at the moment. You know, gold uh, relative to the other markets seems to be holding up very well, but that's not unsurprising because because that's what what gold does. Um, it's um, it's it's doing pretty well. Um, most of our customers uh, generally have uh, mining costs all in at about a thousand or eleven hundred dollars an ounce. So it's seventeen eighteen hundred dollars an ounce you can make you know they're, they're, they're spitting out free cash flow and they're putting that cash uh, back into the ground to develop future future um, uh, resources um, so that's that's all going pretty well uh, the interesting thing that's going on industry wise at the moment well, this is not a just a general thing but everyone seems to be busy very rarely in my 35 years in this industry have I ever uh, recall where everything is going at once. It's gold is strong and that continues to drive our business and will uh, continue to drive our business. Um, But the EV space, the um, copper space, uh, the, you know, the base metal space, I haven't spoken to a driller that has got a spare rig at the moment. So it's, uh, it's looking very much like a soup. It's very much, I would say, I caution to add, it's, it is a cycle. And I would caution to add, I think what, what this is looking like is a super cycle. I don't come along that often. Uh, in my 35 years, I've never really seen one. I've heard of them. Um, but I've never seen it where the drillers are drilling for everything. And, uh, you know, just bear in mind that, you know, that the, the drillers is the, uh, is you know the quintessential canary in the coal mine when the drillers are busy it's because the industry is busy and the reason for that quite simply is that the drillers speak of the the largest of exploration budgets all right and um and, and in West Africa is known for gold. Is the is it just because they they have other minerals there which they haven't been exploring? Because it was like, hey, let's get gold. It's uh, it's the 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 priciest one uh in the or the most profitable one in the portfolio. And now that they they see this opportunity in other metals that they're sort of exploring into non gold uh, uh exploration opportunities. Uh, given they see the the EV sort of super cycle coming, you know, um, West Africa, Ghana specifically, was known as the Gold Coast before it was Ghana, <clears throat> and it was called the Gold Coast. It was, it was the Gold Coast for a simple reason: there's lots of gold there. But the region missed probably 50 years of modern exploration, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, but uh, since about the 90s, uh, Western companies start beginning with the juniors, made their way across to Ghana and, and a halo of countries that surrounded Ghana. Let's, let's call it West Africa, for all intents and purposes. And uh, as a result of, uh, you know, some systematic many years of exploration, along came the intermediates that bought the juniors and then along came the seniors that bought the, the, the intermediates. Today, uh, anyone... You know, it's you know, West Africa is a who's who of who's mining in 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 gold and more recently uh, EV uh, slash battery metals. Um, it's an interesting point when you look at where the gold production comes from in the world. You would naturally assume is it China, is it Russia, is it is it Australia? If you chose any one of those three names, then on any given year you'd be, you'd have the correct answer because they they typically put out about three hundred and fifty metric ton. Uh, per per annum towards towards the global market of about four thousand ton, but the interesting statistic I've got a slide there, Pump. Uh, uh, but it's um, the interesting statistic is if you add the seven seven of the the leading producing nations in West Africa, 
uh, then collectively you would come up with 456 uh, metric ton. So more gold, more gold comes from West Africa today uh, than does any of those three leading producers. And yet geographically, if you measure the size, the footprint of, the, of those seven West African countries, it's approximately half the size of China. The point I'm making is West Africa cannot be overlooked uh, when considering gold and more recently EV uh, exploration. So basically, if you're not in West Africa, you're missing a, a substantial piece of the pie. Yeah. Um, in in the, the quarter, you, you discussed how you've, your uh, rig utilization is at the 78% uh, level uh, increase to that. Is that kind of like you'll never get to 100% uh, utilization rate? Someone's always in the the, the rig for getting is getting moved or it's getting some repairs or maintenance done on it. Um, is it is this kind of the sweet spot where you're you're at with a uh, 78%-ish area? So utilization is currently strong. It's, it's currently 75%. And that is in what we is normally our, our seasonally weakest quarter, quarter uh, three, because of wet season that occurs in West Africa. And that figure, seventy-five percent, is actually on the increased rig fleet. Okay, of seventy-five owned rigs and uh, six rentals. The uh, the thing is, we, you know, we're in perpetually in uh, in kind of growth uh, mode because we we reach seventy percent. You'll recall that when we whenever we reach seventy percent, we basically add rigs. So uh, yeah, so the the seventy five percent figure is is it's it's kind of a it's a figure that will fluctuate from seventy five to eighty eighty percent. We're perpetually in that mode because as we reach seventy percent, we add to the fleet from the cash generated from operations, and we we keep growing the fleet. Today we have a fleet of seventy five to eighty rigs, uh, and in a year's time we'll probably have a fleet of 80 to 85 rigs. If we wind the clock back three, four years ago, we probably had a rig fleet of, I don't know, 45, 50 rigs. So it just keeps increasing and it's all basically self-generated. It's, uh, it's, um, this is what we do with the cash that we generate from our operations. The six rentals, is that indicative of that you're renting because you're not sure that the market's going to stay strong, so you just don't want to buy it? Or is it you needed more drills and that's all that was available in the short term? Yeah, more of the latter. It was um, we, it was a unique situation. We signed a contract in uh, Egypt and the contract required a sudden start. We couldn't, because of the constraint, uh, supply constraint problems out there, we're limited by the manufacturers to get us. The rigs that we need. We just happen to have a perfect situation where the customer had access to six rigs that had owned in its own fleet. And we came to an arrangement where we rented uh, those rigs and, and pretty much put them straight to work. Okay. And the plan is that we will, uh, we will rent them until our new rigs arrive. So two of the six new rigs have arrived. Uh, so two of the rentals drop off. All right. And those rentals are, you You essentially have six rigs in Egypt operating right now? Uh, we actually have eight oh. and uh, soon soon to be nine. Yeah. All right. If you consider that this market only actually started for us, call it a year ago, yeah. uh, it's off to a pretty precocious start. Yeah. I've never seen a, I've never seen a, a division speak for 10 to 15% of our revenues in such a short amount of time. It's, um, as I say, you know, we like Egypt. It's, a, it's our newest market. We're very excited about it. Uh, it is, uh, you know, we've just uh, just negotiated a, a contract with a new junior there. We've got two or three other bids on the go at the moment. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's certainly, uh, it's, it's an interesting market. We like it there. All right. Um can you talk about that, given the high demand, the pricing environment for what you're getting when you bid on a per meter or, or whatever of drilling? And then corollary to that is the, the cost environment. Uh, diesel's going down. Uh, we, we, we sort of hopefully hit, uh, in, from your perspective, uh, peak uh, oil pricing. Um, can you discuss the, the, uh, the, those aspects of the operations? 
Well, costs costs are increasing, sure. I mean, let's that's just that's a that's a known story. I think everyone yeah. knows that story pretty well. And some things go up, and others go down, and others go sideways. But prices are generally trending north. Uh, but draw prices are increasing too. So we we we're keeping well ahead of the game on that score. Yeah. All right. Okay. <clears throat> and um, so you've talked about the rig plans, probably adding about another ten rigs over the coming year to fulfill your uh, expected uh, growth in the business. Yeah, we're just going to keep on keeping on. Um, you know, just going to keep doing what we do. Yeah. Uh, organic growth uh, works for us, 100% organic uh, growth since day one, and that's worked for us very well. So I don't see any any point in changing that. Um, it helps us to keep the rig fleet standard. It, uh, you know, you got to grow your personnel into your rig fleet as well. So... Uh, uh, as I say, regionally, West Africa continues to be our key market. Egypt's going very well. South America's going very well. Um, all uh, divisions are going very well, and all divisions are cash flow positive. So cash being generated from operations uh, on a per division basis will uh, will determine and dictate where we where we invest and how we grow. But um, high level, uh, just more of the same. Um, org- organic growth, you know, just keep on keeping on. What what's the state of your uh, your uh, South American operations right now? Um, how many drills are there? And you mentioned earlier that you're going to be expanding into uh, a new country in the hopefully in the near term. So uh, we have four rigs in South America, uh, and it has been a slower start due to some political uh, things going on in Peru. There was recently a change of. Uh, a president, and um, uh, one reason or another, the, you know, the country for a short time went uh, uh, down the track of, um, you know, whether they want mining or they don't want mining. But you know, the thing fundamentally high level, uh, you know, you just got to you got to look at these things long term. And we, you know, we, you know, this is a marathon for us, so we're uh, we're looking at it saying, well, you know, Peru's the second largest producer of copper in the world, so you know, we we want to be part of that market. Um, so we have four rigs there, and until recently, we had uh, just one of those four rigs, one and a half of those four rigs working. So essentially, you could call that 25% utilisation. Now, you might say that that doesn't sound too interesting, but the thing is, you need to have rigs ready in case you get the call, and we just got the call. So part of that uh, fleet uh, and some will be actually heading down to uh, another country in South America to start another contract shortly. And this is all occurs at a time when we've got three pretty hot bids uh, that we're expecting to hear back from uh, in Peru uh, very shortly, which will actually take us from a situation where we were 25% utilisation until we're to 100% utilisation, and we suddenly need to add rigs. So we've uh, we've just concluded in the last uh, week at our capital uh, budgets meeting. Uh, uh, that we're going to actually be uh, directing uh, more uh, investment uh, quite aggressively towards South America in readiness for what will uh, be uh, uh, what we believe is a sudden uptick. But yeah. worst case scenario, worst case scenario for us in the in the near term is uh, is sort of eighty five percent utilization. Is uh, the busy rainy seasons in South Africa? sort of line up with oh in South America line up with Africa or I'm just wondering is it going to sort of smooth out the seasonality a bit as you you grow your your global footprint uh, seasonality actually uh, it's been pretty kind of late um this is partly you know as a result of a shifting into less seasonally sensitive affected geographies um, you know, here we are in wet season where we'd normally be 60, 60 odd percent utilization and we're at 75. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, part of the overall strategy of moving into, uh, some of these newer, newer geographies are that they're, uh, less, uh, sens- sensitive to things like seasonality. That is, that is actually one of the, you know, the, the fallback, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the issues for us in, in West Africa, particularly in some of the, the two of the northern countries where we work is essentially it just completely shuts down in the wet. Um, we, have, we haven't actually seen that this, this season. It's actually been, it's actually been strong utilisation 
uh, through this quarter. And of course, that all makes for a, um, you know, a strong revenue line, strong strong margin line. And I think this, where this is all sort of basically heading is is that it all makes for an interesting H2 to you know, the tail end of what will be a record year. Gotcha. All right. Um, so Q3 is going to be off of Q2, but maybe not off as much as it sort of typically is, as uh, the weather is uh, in your uh, favor this quarter right now. Spot on. Um, so uh, Q3 is, is seasonally our weakest quarter. Um, so you can expect a Q over Q drop, sure. Um, but that said, it will be our strongest, I believe, uh, wet season quarter in the history of this company. Uh, and on a, Q, on a year over year basis, it'll actually be our best uh, year over year quarter for the year. All right. That's great. Yep. <clears throat> we looking, very, talk- looking, looking, looking very solid. Very oh. solid. And Q4, um, run rate heading into Q4, solid. Very solid. All right. Very solid. Um, and just uh, getting closer to the end here, we, we, you did discuss your cash generation uh, has been strong. You talked about organic growth. I think you may have indicated or implied that uh, grow, uh, acquisition growth isn't uh, a big priority for you as you got consistency of drill rigs and, and education and so forth. So can you give some clarity on what your thoughts are on um, a generally on cash utilized? You've got, I believe, call it $10 million uh, free sitting in the bank and um, uh, and is acquisition uh, uh, a potential use of that uh, cash uh, balance? Well, I think if you look at our net cash at the end of the quarter, it's more like $3 million. So, you know, um, we we don't like debt as a company. We prefer to be, I'd, I'd prefer to be debt free completely if we could. Um, that's maybe not necessary, but certainly, um, you know, the, you know, the KPIs, we tend to, tend to keep a close eye, eye on are things like, you know, net equity to debt, um, uh, debt as a percentage of EBITDA. We actually have some of the best, uh, you know, KPIs in the industry in that regard. But I think you need to in a cyclical business, um, you know. But uh, the best use for cash uh, for us at this point in time is just keep adding rigs. That is the best thing that we can do with our cash. Um, also, a balanced approach to dividends. I think dividends are important. Our investors like dividends, and just on that score, the latter portion of our semi-annual divid- dividend is coming soon. And this should yield us around two and a half percent, which is pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, growth uh, versus yield uh, balance, I think. Um, but yeah, all right. That's the best thing we can do with our cash is just keep just keep throwing it throwing it into the rigs. You know, the the whole prospect of of potentially doing an acquisition for us, uh, we we look at them all the time. They come our way. Some great businesses out there for sale. Here's the challenge. Uh, anyone that's for sale uh, that would, you know, also be uh, uh, courting, uh, let's say, private equity firms, is cha- they're, they're, they're chasing four and a half times EBITDA. We trade at two and a half times EBITDA. So for us, anything we buy would have to be purely purely uh, strategic. It sort of leads us into the valuation gap. Yeah. Um, you know, the valuation gap, which is so obvious, you know, this is the real elef- elephant in the room. You know, the, the, the thing is, Jeddle trades at two and a half times EBITDA and a 20, 20% discount to book. Meanwhile, some of our peers trade at eight times and two to three times book. Now, historically, uh, Jeddle in up cycles uh, trades at four and a half to five times EBITDA and one uh, 1.6 to 1.8 times book. Well, the thing that I'm pointing out uh, here is is that the you know there's there's a disconnect between the valuation of us and our peers. Now, Jeddal stock, uh, if you if that's the measure, uh, you, you know you can look at that and say, well, we've done pretty well lately. We're up we're up 15 percent year over you know year to date. But to be fair, in March we reported uh, a record year. Uh, that was a 40% year-over-year increase revenue-wise, 55% in EBITDA, net income 88%. So I think that, you know, I think the 
the share price bump uh, was long overdue. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it, it, you know, the point I'm making is that relative uh, to uh, operational and fi financial performance, where is cheap today actually cheaper than we've we've actually ever been. And this prompted analysts just recently to raise their their uh, firstly their revenue forecast targets. They've taken us up to 136 million USD for this year, and we're comfortable with that. Uh, they've pegged us uh, consensus has got us at about 30 36 million USD in EBITDA and about 39 cents uh, US cents in in earnings. And I'll just point out, you know, and I'll just remind you, you your, your audience uh, there that this is a stock that trades. At 115 million Canadian market cap has no and has no debt. All so right. For that reason, our, our analysts have taken their targets up to four four dollars and thirty eight uh, Canadian, which is a double based on where we are today, and we're pretty comfortable both with their forecast uh, forecast revenues, uh, their uh, their EBITDA projections, their earnings projections, and of course we're very comfortable with their uh, their share price targets. All right. And, and I guess in, in association with that valuation uh, gap you're discussing, uh, your OTC uh, listing here, that is uh, in part to widen your uh, audience base and uh, hopefully help uh, contribute to uh, reducing any value ga any valuation gap that there is. Yeah, so that's great news for our potential U.S. investors and existing U.S. investors is the fact that today, this morning, actually, we started trading on the OTCQX, and this will allow uh, a greater number of investors to invest in the growth of Geodor and hopefully should go a long way towards improving our liquidity. Yeah. All right. Well, with, with that, Dave, uh, we should wrap things up. Any final uh, comments uh, you'd like to say before we call it a day? Uh, our OTC ticker is uh, GEODF. That's it. Hot off the press. Go get some. All right, Dave. Thank you very much. Uh, great talking to you again and looking forward to seeing uh, the company uh, progress through the, the coming quarters and years. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks, Martin. Cheers.